in the shadows of day and night, in my darkness I must fight. I will not hang my head in shame, for this is not some kind of a game. Yes, I have epilepsy, this is true, but I am still a person just like you. For our next session on management of epilepsy, I would request our chairpersons to please come on stage. Dr. Atul, Atul Mathur sir is a very renowned senior physician of Prayagraj. Dr. K.K. Sonkar sir is a senior neurologist and associate professor in Department of Neurology, MLN Medical College. And Dr. Satyadeo Pandey is assistant professor in the Department of Neurosurgery, MLN Medical College. I would welcome uh, Dr. Jitin Bajaj, who would be speaking. And I request the chairpersons to introduce our speaker. Good afternoon. <coughs> our <coughs> next session on epilepsy, the lecture is to be delivered by Dr. Jitin Bajaj. I may have a small <coughs> introduction. Dr. Jitin Bajaj is MS and MCH in neurosurgery. And uh, <coughs> at present, he is Associate Professor of Neurosurgery at Netaji Subhashchand Bose Medical College, Jabalpur. He has held <coughs> as a section editor in the Neurology India Journal. And he is on the editorial board of Indian Journal of Neurosurgery. And he has been a member of the Team Innovation Center for Global Surgical Innovations and Low Cost Solutions. <coughs> He is the Executive Committee Member of Neurotrauma Society of India, Neurological Surgeon Society of India, and National Epilepsy Surgery, Neuromodulation, and Neurobiology Society. He has three books to his credit, more than 55 book chapters, 73 paper publications in national and international journals, and lots of papers and poster presentations in conferences to his credit. So I invite Dr. Jitin Bajaj to deliver his lecture here. <coughs> Thank you, respected chairpersons, for such a nice introduction. Thank you, IMA Allahabad, Dr. Pankaj Gupta, for giving me the opportunity to present here. I will be speaking on a very uh, common and uh, also complex topic, uh, that is epilepsy. Uh, I am a neurosurgeon uh, with a fellowship in uh, epilepsy surgery. So I will be giving uh, here an overview of the management of epilepsy, both medical and surgical. So we all know and uh, we have all seen uh, a seizure, a seizure which is a transient occurrence of symptoms or signs due to abnormal, excessive or synchronous neuronal activity in the brain. Uh, a seizure doesn't mean that the person has epilepsy. Uh, both are different things. Uh, recently, ILA has classified seizures into focal onset seizures and therefore they have replaced the partial onset with focal onset, generalized onset seizures and unknown onset seizures. I'll be explaining them in detail. Uh, many times patient asks about uh, when he has a seizure, what is the prognosis of me? So we can say that risk for seizure recurrence after first unprovoked seizure is 40 to 50 percent. There are certain factors which may increase the recurrence risk, which are Focal seizures, myoclonic, toniclonic, and seizures after therapy initiation. You can say to the patient that about 60% of patients will, will acquire remission after starting of therapy, and about 50% of patients will relapse after discontinuation of the therapy. So therapy is very important. ILA has classified for the sake of better understanding and treatment purposes into focal onset, generalized onset, and unknown onset seizures. And we should try to classify the seizures and we should avoid just uh, explaining like seizure disorder. What is epilepsy? Epilepsy is defined as either at least two unprovoked seizures occurring more than 24 hours apart or one unprovoked seizure and a probability of further seizures occurring over the next 10 years or a diagnosis of an epilepsy syndrome. And uh, uh, about 69 million people have epilepsy according to the WHO. Uh, the epilepsy is also classified like seizure. First, we have to uh, uh, classify on the basis of seizure type, either into focal, generalized, or if we no, don't know, then unknown. Then to epilepsy type, into again focal, generalized, combined, and unknown. And then, if we can, to epilepsy syndrome. More importantly, ILA has stressed upon the etiological part, that is structural, genetic, and others and comorbidities, because all these have very important role in the treatment aspect. Patient asks, when is my epilepsy considered to be cured? 
So we can say that if you pass the applicable age of an age-dependent epilepsy syndrome, like if you achieve the age after for a absence seizure, uh, if the seizures are controlled for 10 years, or if there is no seizure medicine running for you for the last five years, then you can be called as cured. EEG is very important aspect. <clears throat> it helps in uh, evaluation and management of the epilepsy. It helps in classification of epilepsy, prognosticating and tailoring the treatment. However, we should not rely on a single normal interrectal EEG because the sensitivity is quite low. Coming on to the management part, anti-seizure drugs are the mainstay of the treatment. When should we start? When sh how should we start? I'll be uh, telling in the future slides. The goals are to maximize the seizure control and minimize adverse effects with maximizing quality of life. When should we start the treatment after a single seizure? If they are recurrent seizures, it's straightforward to start the anti-seizure medicines. Well, in some cases, we have to start prophylactically. For example, a patient of severe head injuries, whether they may have a seizure or not, we have to start the treatment. It is beneficial for early post-traumatic seizures. It is class one evidence, but for in some cases, in severe brain damage, we have to continue the treatment for longer time. Similarly, it is controversial, but in some craniotomy cases, tumor cases, we may have to start prophylactically. After a single seizure, there is a dilemma to start the drugs or not, but we have to explain to the patient that you have overall two-year seizure risk of 30 to 40 percent. It may be minimal for normal EG, but maximum for an epileptiform EG. And thus, we can individualize the treatment uh, we have to start for high-risk activities and if the patient has abnormal EG, we should start the treatment. Importantly, after a first treatment after a first tonic-clonic seizure, half the risk from 40% to 20%. This is a general algorithm. If we confirm a diagnosis of uh, epilepsy and classify them in either of the category, we have to start the treatment. We have to start with the most appropriate anti-seizure medicine at the lowest effective dose. If the seizures are controlled, then it's well and good. If the seizures are not controlled, we have to increase the doses to the maximum possible dose without having side effects. If the drug is not effective, then we have to substitute to the, with the other drug or we have to uh, go for polytherapy. If, the, if more than two drugs are not effective, then we have to consider the patient for epilepsy surgery or alternative treatments. For a focal onset seizures, most effective drugs are lamotrigine, carbamazepine, and lately oxcarbamazepine. For generalized onset and unclassified seizures, Senatrial has told sodium valproate and lamotrigine to be the most effective drugs. Lately, levotristam and topramate are able alternatives. There are a host of factors on which we have to decide and select the drugs, like age, sex, ethnicity, genetics, and several others. And uh, this is a website, you can take a picture of uh, this. Uh, this is a free website on which we, you can just uh, put on multiple choice questions your demographics of the patient and they will tell first, second and third choice drugs based on that. There are certain newer anti-seizure medicines. Uh, in summary, these have better side effect and drug interaction profile and nearly similar efficacy profile. Epilepsy during pregnancy is important chapter. Uh, this is because there are many drugs which interact with contraceptives and which have uh, the malformations for the babies. You have to uh, keep in mind that about 20 to, 20 to 50 percent of patients with epilepsy will have increased risk of seizures during pregnancy. Folic acid supplementation is very important and every patient with ep every female patient with epilepsy should have folic acid of 5 mg per day even before the pregnancy. And whenever contraception is planned, non-hormonal forms should be preferred. This is a chart showing how clearance of uh, drugs increases during the trimesters. The uh, levotiristam, which is commonly prescribed drug in pregnancy, has to be, uh, the doses has to be increased for 1.5 to 2 times during the first trimester of pregnancy. While lamotrigine, which is another second uh, common drug prescribed in pregnancy, has to be increased in the third trimester. The benefits of breastfeeding has outweighed the risks. And uh, more importantly, we should understand that anti-seizure medicines in breast milk have undetectable or below the therapeutic range, and uh, all drugs should be uh, given. The drugs with uh, having malformation, we all know that valproic acid is a notorious drug, and other uh, older drugs like phenytoin, phenobarbitan, they should be avoided in the pregnancy period. 
and lamotrigine and levetiracetam should be preferred. Coming on to the pharmacological resistance, we have to keep in mind that despite of um, uh, all newer drugs and best of therapy, approximately one third of the patients become drug resistant and uh, uh, whatever multiple drugs you add, uh, they, will become, they will be pharmacoresistant. Importantly, if you have a focal lesion on MRI, any, every new drug may have a honeymoon period of respondents for a certain time, but ultimately they will be very high risk of drug resistant epilepsy. What is DRE? ILA has classified drug resistant epilepsy as a failure of adequate trials of two tolerated and appropriately chosen and used anti seizure medicine schedules. And this has to be respected. Every word is important. Uh, why it is important? Because there is very high risk of sudden and expected death in epilepsy, uh, amounting to 0.1% annual mortality rate. And this mortality rate is compounding. It also causes decreased quality of life and increased cost of living. There is class 1 evidence for epilepsy surgery for drug resistant epilepsy, both for adults as well as in children. And both these trials which are published in NEGM have shown that a surgical arm have better uh, respondents than the medical arm for uh, drug resistant epilepsy. Not only the epilepsy reduces uh, the seizure burden, but it also reduces stigma, which is quite prevalent in the epilepsy population. How we, how we should make an epilepsy surgery team? Uh, there should be a neurologist, neurosurgeon, neuroradiologist, neuropsychologist, EG technicians and nursing staff. More importantly, these should have interest in the field of epilepsy. Uh, when we decide a patient to undergo surgery, he has to have a pre-surgical evaluation. Now, ILE has given a very detailed set of investigations for different pathologies. But in summary, we should have a good history and physical examination of the patient. The patient should undergo interictal and ictal or video EG examination, an MRI brain in the epilepsy protocol, and neuropsychological examination. Now, with these investigations, more than 60% of the patients can undergo surgery in any uh, center. When, the, when there is discordance between the electrophysiology, clinical and MRI, uh, the patient needs to undergo advanced investigations like functional MRI, PET, SPECT, magnetoencephalography or stereo EG. Now, as I said, this is a patient of tuberous sclerosis. You can see multiple adenoma sebaceums, hyperpigmented patches, Ung, uh, subungual fibromas, hematomas in the retina, and in the MRI you can see uh, periventricular heterotopias. These patients often become drug resistant, and these needs to undergo surgery. Uh, other patients like Sturge Weber syndrome, where we uh, the patient has facial nevus in the uh, ophthalmic division of trigeminal nerve, and the MRI you can see gyral enhancements and choroid plexus enhancement. Patients of a hemimegalencephaly, where we have the patient has uh, <coughs> hypertrophy of the left side hemisphere and uh, uh, nevus on the scalp. These patients are also drug resistant. Now, epilepsy surgery can be divided artificially into resective type or disconnective type. Resective means when we resect out the portion of the brain or disconnective when we disconnect the abnormal brain from the rest of the brain. And it can also be divided into curative type of surgery or palliative one. Curative, when, the, uh, when we decide and give option to the patient that your, uh, your disease can be cured and when the disease cannot be cured, uh, at least you can have palliative option uh, and then the palliative surgery is offered. Now, few case, scenario, case scenarios. Uh, <coughs> Mesial temporal sclerosis, which is one of the commonest adult onset epilepsy, epi uh, drug resistant epilepsy. And here we can see uh, left uh, hippocampal sclerosis. And these type of patients, if drug resistant and clinical electro radiologically concordant, that which means if the EG data, MRI data, and clinical data uh, coincides, then these patients benefit with the left temporal lobectomy uh, and amygdalo hippocampectomy. So the patient underwent the same procedure, and uh, he could be uh, made drug free and seizure free uh, after two years. Another patient with bottom of sulcal dysplasia, and these patients require intraoperative electrocorticography. And you can see in the uh, compare the pre-resection, post-resection uh, 
ECOG data, which shows uh, considerably reduced uh, spike activity. And this patient also could be made seizure-free and drug-free. Certain patients require awake craniotomies where the lesion is located near the motor and uh, language areas. And the, this lesion was focal cortical dysplasia type 1. Some patients have very, very long st uh, standing epilepsy and uh, whole of the hemisphere is involved, uh, like MCS stroke, Rasmussen's encephalitis. Uh, and many of these patients have intact uh, speech despite of having left uh, hemispheric involvement. Uh, for example, in this patient who had uh, left MCS stroke since childhood and she presented to us at the age of 27 years, that is epilepsy for her last 25 years. And uh, because her speech was intact despite of having left MCS stroke and uh, right lower limb uh, intact, uh, she underwent a functional MRI and because of the neuroplasticity, both her right lower limb power and speech were both localized to the right hemisphere. And because of this, we had the confidence and uh, she underwent endoscopic left-sided hemispherotomy, which means disconnection of this whole hemisphere, the left hemisphere, from the uh, basal ganglia and the rest part of the brain. And despite of disconnection, she could uh, walk uh, in the immediate post-op period and she could also had uh, intact speech and she could also be made uh, seizure-free and uh, her drugs have been considerably reduced. Sometimes patients have indolent cysts like this, arachnoid cyst, and if we undergo close uh, extensive investigations, they may have uh, hyper uh, intensity around that uh, lesion. And these patients also benefit from resection, uh, which may be curative. Uh, electrocorticography, like in previous case, uh, was uh, important in these cases. Some patients have a continuous epilepsia partialis continua, like in this child who had a left hemisphere, left face uh, continuous seizure for last, uh, I think, two to three years. And he was on four anti-seizure medicines. And uh, on uh, preoperative MRI, uh, if we look closely, we can see this hyperintensity around this sulcus. And uh, this area is dysplastic. And he also underwent resection of the same and achieved a uh, class one outcome. The electrocardiography was also helpful in this case. Sometimes uh, we need to introduce radio frequency thermocoagulation. That is a uh, minimally invasive option for deeply located lesions like hypothalamic hematomas. And the, uh, because of minimally invasive nature, the uh, prognosis and uh, recovery is very fast. Sometimes the uh, lesion is not localized on MRI and we need to uh, give alternate therapies like ketogenic diet, vagus nerve stimulation and deep brain stimulation, these may be palliative options. So we had about 55 cases in our series uh, of all types of pathologies. Uh, the uh, <coughs> class 1 outcome was achieved in 67% of cases. Drugs could be tapered in 72% cases. About 25% of cases achieved complete freedom from drugs. And 56% patients had neurological, uh, neuropsychological improvements. There were transient complications. Uh, to summarize, uh, epilepsy is a common disease with physical, cognitive and social problems. Anti-seizure medicines are main approach to the treatment and uh, two-thirds of the patients achieve seizure freedom with the drugs only. But with the best of the drugs, about one-third of the patients uh, are drug resistant and for them, uh, epilepsy surgery can be offered and they are, uh, the surgery is effective. In few of the cases uh, where the surgery cannot be offered, ketogenic diet and neurostimulation treatments are alternate treatments. Thank you to my teachers. Thank you. I finished in time. Thank you, Dr. Jitin Bajaj, sir, for your lucid and elaborative session on management of epilepsy. And uh, in very short time, you cover all medical as well as surgical. Although topic is very broad, but in 20 minute session, you have elaborated and enumerated every part of the management. Thank you. House is open for the question. If any question, please.
Dr. Jitin, I am a neurologist uh, over this city. Sometimes, uh, although sometimes again we can see rarely I have faced a problem. Uh, you have said ki it is common uh, um, surgery in MTS, but when uh, some patients you got bilateral MTS, then how will you decide the which side you have to uh, which side to have to have and if both sides are epileptic, then how to manage the case? Thank you, sir, for raising this question. This is a very pertinent question. Many patients have uh, bilateral MTS and uh, in one study it was said that ultimately uh, one side MTS leads to bilateral things also. So in those cases, uh, if the primary investigation doesn't offer a clear-cut diagnosis, then we may uh, go for stereoencephalography where we introduce bilateral stereo, uh, <coughs> stereo EG electrodes in both of the hippocampus. And then if the, when the seizure, is, uh, seizure is, uh, arises, we can see uh, on which hippocampus it arises first. And uh, we have to see for these four, uh, three to four episodes ultimate, uh, till the neurologist is satisfied and uh, the seizures which are habitual ones. So based on the stereo EG data, we, then we can decide. Uh, hmm? Jitin sir, one more question. Hello. Either. Sir. Uh, very nice and formative talk. Just one question. In one paper, you mentioned there is need for immediate stoppage of the anti seizure medications. No, Do no. you follow in all patients? No, no, sir. Uh, the medicines are reduced in adults after six months yeah. and children after one year of age. Okay. In uh, the uh, hemispherotomy patients, we have to reduce the drugs, uh, the drugs like clobazam and sometimes valproate, which produce drowsiness. What happens after hemispherotomy? there is decreased activation from one hemisphere. So the patient becomes drowsy in the immediate post-operative period. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have uh, published that in the Neurology India also, that about uh, we have to reduce the clobazam in s about 75% of the cases in the immediate post-operative period for only for hemispherotomy, okay. not for other cases. Thank you. Dr. Jitin, I have a question. For the sake of house, we want to know what criteria do you follow in your institution to stop the anti-epileptic drugs, especially in post-traumatic seizure disorders? Thank you again for raising this question. Now, uh, <clears throat> in few of the cases like uh, a pure extradural hematoma, we only give for seven days and then we stop in, uh, in the tapering doses in about uh, 15 days to one month. But however, for contusions uh, or wherever there is diffuse axonal injury, there is brain damage, we may need to uh, continue drugs for about three to four months. And again, uh, we have to taper it very slowly. That is our institutional protocol. Jitin, if patient is not having seizures for at least two years, then how uh, you wean of these patients in how much period and how you stop it? Thank you again. Uh, we have to characterize, individualize that for the patient. Now, there are some uh, ailments which are reversible. I mean, uh, you had a trauma, a patient had a trauma, tumor surgery. And in those cases, the uh, problem is cured and then we can have a EG, it is normal, then we can slowly taper it down. But in same, some cases like focal cortical dysplasias, in those cases we have to continue the drugs for lifelong. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Sir.